Turn with me, please, in your copy of God's Word to Luke chapter 14. Luke 14, and we'll look together at verses 12 through 24 this morning. Luke 14, 12 to 24. He said also to the man who had invited him, When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. When one of those who reclined at table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he said to him, A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please have me, be, please have me excused. And another said, I have bought... Five yoke of oxen, and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. So far, the reading from God's word this morning, may he add its blessing to our hearts. There is something about people that loves applause. Some of us have uh, personality types that love big applause. We don't mind uh, being on a stage and have people applause us for, applaud us for our efforts. Others prefer the applause of men in smaller doses, more condensed forms, maybe uh, the thank you of uh, mom and dad or, or the uh, grateful approval of, of somebody just alone at, at home. Now, these things, these, these longings for approval, these are a natural part of what it means to be a person. However, any, any good thing can be taken to excess, can it not? Any good thing can, uh, can lead to the exclusion of others. And in that, in that case, it would turn into something that instead of is normal, turns into something that is sinful. The praise of man must be held in, in proper balance. And that is what Jesus is setting before the people today. The Christian life is, is not to be lived for the praise of man. But the Christian life is, is lived in response to the call of the gospel, uh, the result of which is praise to God, of course. So as we examine this, as Jesus continues his Sabbath luncheon with this Pharisee, we look first at the laying bare of the motives of the Pharisee in having this party. And then second of all, we make plain, Jesus makes plain for us the heart of the matter. So, as we consider the Christian life not lived for the praise of men, but lived in response to the call of the gospel with praise to God, we first will look at laying bare the motives in verses 12 through 14, and then making plain the heart in verses 15 through 24. So, as I've said before, here we are. Jesus is at the third installment of teaching that he's going to give at this luncheon on this Sabbath day. He's been invited, you remember, to this Pharisee's house. He's uh, reproved the Pharisees on their Sabbath practices already. He has reproved the guests about how they are positioning themselves for personal advancement at this party. And now Jesus turns to the host of the party itself and, and teaches us through him uh, proper motives uh, for how we serve God. He has not been the Jesus meek and mild that we would like to remember him as, but he has been Jesus the direct teacher, Jesus the one who sets before his audience the things that they need for godliness, uh, the, both the things that they need for salvation and also the things that they need for right living. And here as Jesus turns in verse 12 to address the man who had invited him, he turns to address them, uh, to address this man for the very motive behind his feast. 
It seems that this man's feast was one giant PR campaign, doesn't it? Both for the people who were in attendance, the guests, they were trying to position themselves by having the best couches. But here also you have a I'll scratch your back, you scratch my back kind of mentality in the man who hosts the party itself. And so Jesus here addresses this, this man. He, he, he says to this man, you're currying favor. You're inviting your friends. You're inviting your brothers. You're inviting your relatives. You're inviting your rich neighbors. He's identifying that fundamental attitude. That I will help you if you will help me. It's kind of like a, a marketing scheme, right? You've got to spend money to make money. That's what this man is doing. He's having a party at his house so that this party would reap benefits for him in the future. And Jesus is pointing out this sin in, in his attitude. Now, I don't want us to come away with the idea that Jesus is anti-friend, that Jesus is anti-family, that Jesus is saying you can never have your, your family and your friends over, that you, are, you should never have anybody wealthy into your home. Jesus isn't. Uh, he isn't a social activist. Jesus isn't against those things. He's not a social crusader. But Jesus is interested in the heart of this man. Jesus is interested in pointing out the main motivation that this man has in hosting this party. Because the host of this party is investing in vanity. He's investing in things that will fade and pass. He's investing in things that will only serve his own flesh. And so Jesus is bringing correction. And the correction that Jesus gives to this man is that he should bring to his party, in verse 13 it says this, people who are poor, crippled, lame, and blind. Now that for Jesus' day is a very different statement than it is for our day. Have you thought of that? To invite people who are crippled, lame, blind, and poor. It's different in our culture than it would have been in, in Jesus' day. In our day, the crippled and the lame are, are people in wheelchairs, people on motorized scooters. They're not dependent like people were in that time. Uh, somebody who is crippled and, and lame in our day can have a hope of a pretty normal life, moving, independence, a good job where they can support themselves. All these things are possible. Think of the poor in our land. It's different than the poor in Jesus' day. What is the number one problem among, among the poor in our day, in our culture? Have you thought about it? Obesity. Obesity is the number one problem of the poor in our time and in our place. It's a different category of people. People are not as dependent on the, the benevolence of others to supply them with what they need to live, to live for the next day. You have the lame, you have the poor, you have the blind. In our day, these people can have a, a fairly normal life. But in Jesus' day, it's a, it's a very different thing. Uh, Jesus' day, if you were poor and lame and crippled and blind, you had, you had nothing. So for the host of this party to invite these people to his house, he's inviting people to his house who would have no hope of giving him anything of benefit. To invite the lame, the poor, and the blind would mean that you would invite people only to whom you would give. There would be no receiving anything from these people. All you do is give. You give with no expectation of return. So if you're the Pharisee who's hosting the party, it would be a very poor investment. It'd be like throwing money away for him. Uh, You've got to spend money to make money. That was his mentality. But he would be throwing money at people who would never be able to give him anything in return. There was no personal advancement in the immediate for this man at all. But that is the very thing that Jesus sets before him as the attitude to be pursued. Now, he doesn't leave this man without hope. But he does change this, man, this man's perspective. Did you notice it? In verse uh, 14, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. This man is thinking, I will be repaid right now. He's thinking about his wallet. He's thinking about his flesh. He's thinking about the applause that he can receive right now.
But Jesus is pointing him to eschatology. Eschatology, the study of the last things. He's, he's taking this man to what will happen when the God of the universe comes back. When you stand before Him, what will be the response of this God? Will you have served Him to His glory, or will you have only served yourself? The reward is eschatological because you don't receive any benefit necessarily in serving the Lord today. There might be a benefit for some, but for some there will be no benefit in serving the Lord. Think about our, our persecuted brothers and sisters. We live, we're here in a comfortable church. We have air conditioning. It's all good. Nobody's knocking down the door to chase us down for what we've said for our service to the Lord Jesus Christ. But there are those in other lands who because they serve the Lord Jesus Christ, they spent the night last night in prison. Because they serve the Lord Jesus Christ, they know that the house that they lived in has been bulldozed down or has been given to another. There are people who have served the Lord Jesus Christ and they know tomorrow when they wake up, they will die for it. They receive no benefit today. But they receive a benefit in the eschaton, in the last days. When they stand before God, God will see them and He will, he will declare to for all to hear the faith that these people had in the sacrifice of His Son. He will declare for all to hear that this is a good and faithful servant, that this one will come and enter into the rest of His Father. This is the glory of anticipating what will happen in the end times, what will happen eschatologically. That's what Jesus does to this man. He points him to the last days. He says, get your mind off what's today and start thinking about what will happen on the last day. Then he also makes plain to this man the heart of the matter. We see that in verses 15 through 25. Jesus has introduced this idea of, of looking towards what will happen when you stand before Lord God Almighty in the, on the last day. But it's a passing comment of one of his fellow guests that really opens the door for him to, to declare the wonderful blessing of what it means to hear the gospel and what it means to respond in a way that honors, honors Christ. There's a man, he, he's laying on the, on the couch eating lunch with Jesus and, and he says in verse 15, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Is that not true? It is true. It is true. Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But you notice something in, in verse 16. There's that first word always that can cause us to reflect on what just happened. That little word, but. This man makes a statement that is true and Jesus says, but. Uh, but, something else. There is a qualification that must be made when it comes to this man's statement. Who is it that will be in the kingdom of God? Who is it that will eat bread in the kingdom of God? And that is what Jesus begins to put his finger on. Because who is Jesus talking to here in this passage? He's talking to Jewish people. He's talking to the people who belong to the family of God. He's talking to the people who for thousands of years have been in the privileged position of hearing that call, that invitation, come and be my people. Live in accordance to my word. I have brought you out of Egypt. I have led you out of the land of slavery. Be my people. And so Jesus tells a, a parable to clarify what it means to be in the kingdom of God. And the parable is pretty straightforward. A man has a, a great banquet that he has, he has planned. He's, he's put together his invitations and he's sent them out to, to many people, it says. The food has been prepared now and the table is set and the, the host has expended all this capital and all this energy to, to prepare this feast. And, and then he sends, his, he sends his servant out. Go and, and, and gather all the people that I have invited all the people who got the save the date card, get them all over here so that they can partake with me in this great banquet. And as this servant goes out there, 
there come the excuses. One after another, the excuses come, and they're not very good excuses either. They're not excuses that would make the host of the banquet say, well, he's really in a bad place, so I can understand why he can't make it. I've bought a field. I have to go look at it. I can't, can't come to your banquet. I've, I've bought some oxen. I can't come to your banquet. I have to go look at the oxen. Is that field going to go anywhere? Is it leaving? Are the oxen going to wander off? The person he bought them from going to open the gate and let these, these oxen leave? This man who, who says he's just married a wife in Jewish law, the first year for this man is life at home. There's nothing urgent going on in his life right now. They come to Christ with these, or they come to the master of the banquet with these, these weak excuses. They come with these these things, these excuses that say to the master of the banquet, I don't care. I don't care about your banquet. I don't care that you've invited me to this banquet. I have some pressing things that I want to attend to right now, in the immediate. I want myself uh, served right now. And so what's the master's response to that? When the servant comes and reports what happens, the master comes and, and he sends this this servant out to the, the streets, streets of the city, and he, and he says, well, bring other people in. And all these other people come to this, this feast, and there are still seats left at the feast. And so then he comes, uh, this, this master, and he, and he says, go find the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame, and bring them to the feast. Even, even compel them or force them to come and, and fill the house. And Jesus, you, you notice what he did here. He took all the people that he said the Pharisees should have invited to his banquet, and he says these are the people that the, the host of the banquet has invited. And, and not only has he invited them, but he has gone to the street corners, to the hedges of the streets, to compel these people to come into this house. Why? Because the people who originally received the invitation will never, ever, ever partake in the banquet feast as a result of their rejection. Of him. Their invitations are canceled for good. So, in telling this parable, Jesus is, a, is addressing the misconceptions of his audience the Pharisee, his guests, his family members. Who, who were the Pharisees? The Pharisees were the, the spiritual leaders of the day, they were the people who came to church twice every Lord's Day, they were the people who sat in the front row. They were the people who served the church diligently. They were meticulous in their obedience of the, the traditions of the fathers. What would you think their expectation would be about their place in the kingdom of God? These people came thinking, we are of the family of Abraham. These people came thinking, we are not Gentiles. We are not born in adultery. We are the sons of Abraham. Of course, we will be in the kingdom of God. They're anxiously awaiting the restoration of Davidic Israel. That's the cry for the Messiah all the time. They're waiting for David's kingdom, the kingdom of God, to be restored, and they fully expect that they will be in this kingdom when that takes place. They will be at the center of the feast in the kingdom of God. But they're in, there's that word again. Verse 16, Luke writes it down. But they might expect to be in the kingdom of God, but Jesus is about to set before them their misconceptions. Jesus looks around him at this, this Sabbath lunch, and all he sees, all Jesus sees, are people who are disqualified. People who are disqualified from entering into the feast of the kingdom of God of God. He's looking at people who won't have any part in the marriage feast of the Lamb. He's looking at those who will be outside. And when that door closes, they will be the people who are banging on the door saying, did we not do mighty things in your name? And God will turn to these people and say, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I never knew you. That's who Jesus sees around him. The Pharisees and, and his guests, they are among the privileged of Jesus' day. 
privileged because they have received an invitation not to the banquet on this Sabbath day, but they've received an invitation to the banquet in the kingdom of God. In fact, this invitation is given to all of the nation of Israel as God's chosen people. But error had crept in. It crept into the nation of Israel. It happens in the church. And in the Old Testament church, we're, we're confronted with these errors. And in some cases, these errors are, are so grossly applied that you can hardly miss them. You go to Judges and, and First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, and you can read all about these accounts of, of gross idolatry that the people of Israel commit, even sacrificing their children in the fire. They had become just as bad, and in some cases it says even worse than the nations who were in Canaan before them. This has happened to the, the Old Testament church, the, the church in Israel. They had built the golden calf. They had worshipped the Baals. They've worshipped Ashtoreth. But there is also a more, a more subtle form of how the Old Testament church had, had gone astray. You know that, uh, that illustration. It's like a math illustration, right? If you, if you have two lines that are parallel, that's great. They'll, they'll go into parallel, into, into perpetuity, into infinity. Either way, they'll never touch, and they'll never cross each other. But if you have one line and you skew it off one degree, for a while it will seem like they're running very close to each other. But you go a little bit down the road and they're so far apart, you don't even, you can't even see the other line when you're standing on the line that's deviated. Well, that's kind of what's, what's taking place here. This subtle form, this, this subtle error that has crept into the lives of the Pharisees. And this is the error. You ready? They have, con they have confused onomatology with cardiology. That's the error, the subtle error of the people of Israel. Now, what is onomatology? Onomatology is the study of last names. Cardiology, we know, is the study of your heart. And so this is the error that the people of Israel had made. They had put all their confidence in onomatology. What is my last name? I am Ben Abraham. That's my last name. I belong to the family of Abraham. And they had forgotten something that is so central, not only to the New Testament, but also to the Old Testament. And it is an issue of cardiology. What is your heart like? You must be right in your heart in order for your onomatology to be in any sense meaningful. They were the children of Abraham, but the children of Abraham were called by God to look at their own hearts that they would not deceive themselves without, uh, by, by a consideration of their onomatology apart from their car cardiology. In Deuteronomy chapter 29, uh, this is a, not a place that you would think that, that God would talk about the, the, the importance of the heart of a man. But it is exactly in the book of Deuteronomy that he talks about it. He talks about it in Deuteronomy 6. We're going to look at Deuteronomy chapter 20, 29. Because it talks both about who the la what the last name is of the person and what his heart is like. Uh, chapter 29 and verse 18 of Deuteronomy 29 says this. Talking to who? Who's, who are we talking to in Deuteronomy? We're talking to the people of Israel. We're talking to God's people. We're talking about to the people who have heard the call of, of the, the gospel in the Old Testament. It says there, Beware lest there be among you a man or a woman or clan or tribe whose heart is turning away today from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of those nations. Turning away today from the Lord our God. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I'm going to read it again. Same sentence. Beware lest there be among you a root bearing poisonous and bitter fruit one who, when he hears the words of this sworn covenant, blesses himself in his heart, saying, I shall be safe, though I walk in the stubbornness of my heart. What can happen to the people of Israel? They can look at their onomatology. What's my last name? I'm okay because my last name is okay. Without looking at their cardiology. If my last name is the son of Abraham, and my heart is devoid of love for God, my last name will do me no good at all. Haven't you noticed that about Scripture? 
Haven't you seen that in the history of the people of Israel? Whose last name did Ishmael have? Ishmael was a son of Abraham, and yet he was cursed by God. Esau, did he not bear the family name, the name of Jacob? And yet what does it say in Romans 9 about Jacob and Esau? Jacob I have loved, and Esau I have hated. This is the story of Scripture. They had the right last name, but their issue was one of cardiology. Something was wrong with their heart. The Lord says repeatedly in His Word that bad cardiology means an exclusion from the land. That's the symbol in the Old Testament. You see this, this bad cardiology that the people of Israel develop over centuries. And they're let out of the land. They're cast out of the land. It's that final sign from God that you, your, your, your last name means nothing to me if you're a worshiper of idols. In uh, Psalm chapter 23, a very well-known song, right? The, the Lord is my shepherd, I, I shall not want. In the beginning of verse 5 in that psalm, it says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Uh, there we are. This invitation to the banquet has been issued in the Old Testament. But to whom has that invitation been issued? How does that psalm start again? The Lord is my shepherd. There is an indication that the cardiology is right. His heart is right. The Lord is my shepherd. The one whose heart is set on the Lord, he will have a, a feast prepared for him in the presence of his enemies. One, the one who calls the Lord his shepherd. And that is the essence, not only of, of what takes place in the Old Testament. It's the essence of what Christ is teaching here through, through this parable. This gospel message of the importance of a healthy cardiology apart from onomatology. If you only think about your last name, whether you're Jewish or uh, externally Christian, culturally Christian, if you're only thinking, I'm a member of a church, so I'm going to be okay. If you're thinking, I have the right last name, in essence, you are man-centered. In essence, you are doing exactly what that Pharisee did. You're looking for a short-term solution to an eternal problem. Onomatology always focuses on me because the focus on onomatology and geography uh, is exactly what is plaguing this Pharisee. He's saying, because I am a son of Abraham, because I belong to the people of Israel, therefore all will be well with me. And it's not a problem that is reserved only for the Pharisees. It is a problem that plagues the church today as well. Many are invited, but they presume on the invitation because they are in the right location, bearing the right name. They are Christians, don't you know? We live in the South. We are all Christians. This is not a, an attack on a particular denomination that has a corner on, on this problem. We are all among those who are invited. God's Word calls us all to faith in Christ, calls us all to obedience in Him. And now the church, the church is called to take our seat at the wedding feast of the Lamb. That's what the gospel issue is for you today. For all of you, it doesn't matter if you're 2 or if you're 82. This is the question, this is the call that is issued to you. There is a feast there is a great banquet. It has been prepared for you. And here is the call. Will you come and delight yourself in the presence of that feast? Will you do that? Or will you make excuse? Wait until my college years are done. After my college years are done, then I will come to the feast. Let me first earn my uh, my fortune, my first million. After I've earned my first million, then I'll start uh, honoring the Lord's Day and, and coming to church and serving the Lord as I should. But I need to be financially established first. Let me build a name for myself first. 
and then I can come to your feast. Only when I'm established in culture, then I will be free. I might even be able to make a great difference for the Lord because people will listen to me because I am influential in the world. Unfortunately, I have to neglect the things of the Lord while those things are taking place. But I will come after. I will come after those things have been established for me. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. I've been baptized as a child. I'm a member of the church. Don't worry. Maybe even better. I've been baptized as an adult. Don't worry. I'm going to be okay because I am a member of a church. All of those things, beloved, all of those things are questions of onomatology. You're thinking about your last name. You're not thinking about the condition of your heart. The condition of your heart is what should be first on your mind as you respond to the invitation of your master. Don't say God's name rests on me, I'm in his church. Your cardiology could be completely poor. In that case, your inclination is away from the banquet. banquet. And guess what? If you hear that the banquet is there and you refuse to go in the first place, you'll probably refuse when that second invitation or when you start thinking about the invitation as well. Because your refusal to heed the invitation in the first place is a, is a reflection of what is valuable to you. It's a reflection of what you value more. And it's not the Lord Jesus Christ and His salvation. Your name is, is properly understood only by a heart that is turned towards the Lord. Your onomatology only makes sense when your cardiology is right. And so as the people of God, we must strive for eternal approval first. The approval of man. It's a fading commodity, isn't it? We've all seen that in our lives. We've seen how friends who we thought would be our eternal friends have, have turned on us. How strife has entered into, into our families or into our churches or, or into our workplaces. Though we may have been the stellar employee at one point, we've done one thing wrong and now we are a, a fading, fading commodity. And yet it is that approval of man that we so quickly seek, isn't it? It's that approval of man that we long so for so deeply. Instead, Jesus here in this passage is calling us to, to place our treasure in the heavenly places, to make our reward not in the presence, but to make our reward eschatological in the last times. We don't live for man's praise, people of God. If we do live for man's praise, I have bad news for you. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount that if you seek the praise of man in the present, you will have received your reward in full. That's all you're going to get is the fleeting praise of man. But the people of God must strive for this eternal approval. Our hearts must be set on, on serving God with the possibility that nobody may ever affirm us in this endeavor in this life. That is the reality for the Christian. But this reality, though it seems stark, is the only reality that guarantees peace for you. It is the only reality that guarantees joy for you. Because it is the only reality that will never change because it is guaranteed by our immutable, unchanging God. We do not live for this world. And so we have to ask ourselves questions. Are we willing, people of God, are we willing to be made a laughing stock to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, to serve our Redeemer? Are we willing to do that? I want us to think through church history. There was a, a man, Athanasius. You've heard of the Athanasian Creed, right? He lives fourth century. And he is instrumental. God uses this man instrumentally to preserve a right view of the Trinity in church history. He fought against a man named Arius who denied that Jesus was God. And he was the forerunner of the Jehovah's Witness of our day, this Arius. And this Arius was such an influential man that he had won over much of the church to his position. But Athanasius was tenacious. You can remember it. Athanasius the tenacious, right? He held firm to the word of God and he said, No, I will not serve for man. I will serve only for the glory of my God. And what was his reward? Five times. 
Five times he's banished from his place. Five times he's banished from his office. People say five times, if you are going to hold that position, Athanasius, the tenacious, you're gone. And then something would change and they'd bring him back again. And they'd get back into the controversy. And Athanasius would again say, no, I will stand firm for the Lord only. Pack your bags, you're out of here again. Five times they bring him back. Finally, the Lord blesses uh, Athanasius and his mercy and his ministry so that we ha have our understanding of the Trinity that we have. In his case, it ended with a happy ending. But in many cases, it doesn't end in a, a happy ending. In many cases, the Christian who stands firm for the glory of God must ask himself this question. Am I willing to be ground into dust to serve God? Am I willing to be nothing, to be counted as of no consequence? Am I willing to be despised by my friends, my family, my rich neighbors in order to serve the Lord God who has saved me? That's the question that we're answering, that we're asking ourselves today. Because Jesus is saying here in this, this parable that our call is not to love the approval of man. Our call is not even to love the approval of our own voice that is in our head. We are a man or a woman. It doesn't matter what we say about ourselves. It matters what God says about us. It matters whether or not our heart is in a healthy place. So we're to seek and strive for eternal approval first. We're to love the approval of the Lord. This, uh, this parable this passage of Scripture also teaches us that the people of God must not, not neglect their spiritual cardio. Uh, Jesus here is uh, addressing the heart of, uh, of his audience. He's, he's not concerned with what's on the outside. He's concerned with what's in here. He wants their hearts to be in the right place. The onomatology is for Jesus not as significant as the cardiology. Doctors tell us that a the key to a healthy heart is, is exercise, right? We're supposed to exercise so that we, we, we maintain proper blood flow and all those kinds of things. Uh, calcium and plaque and all. It doesn't build up. We need a healthy heart. So it is with the spiritual condition of our hearts. The exercises of the heart keep our hearts healthy. So, do you neglect your prayer life? If you neglect your prayer life, it is like going to McDonald's and ordering two supersized Big Mac meals every two hours and only sitting on your couch and eating them. That's what it does for your heart. Do you neglect the reading of God's Word? It's like getting a, a bag of Doritos. And taking, you know, those big cans of cheese sauce that you can get at Sam's Club? You put it in a bowl and you take this cheese sauce and you spread it all over and you just eat it all up. You eat it all, all in one sitting while making a commitment to yourself, I will not move for a week. To neglect the reading of God's Word, that's what you're doing to your heart. Do you neglect the preaching of God's Word? It's the equivalent of, of taking a gallon of ice cream. And I'm not talking the low-fat kind. I'm talking the full-fat kind, maybe the kind with extra fat added in. A gallon of ice cream, smothering it in chocolate sauce, and you sit down and eat it, and you won't even share a bite with anybody while you play the Wii all day long. This is what you're doing to your heart. Now, I know you kids, I know my kids, I know my kids are sitting here thinking, well, that doesn't sound so bad. That sounds kind of good, actually. Have you ever seen what somebody looks like who's committed to that kind of life? Do they look healthy? Do they look like they're taking care of themselves? Or do they look weak? Do they look like they can't take care of themselves? We must be concerned about the cardiology of our hearts. We must be concerned about our spiritual health. We don't want to be a spiritual ticking time bomb waiting for that heart attack to come in when all falls apart. Exercise your heart. Read God's word. Pray to him. Commit yourselves to 
uh, through the preaching of the word so that it will be well with you, so that you would be fixed on Christ. Make your onomatology, make your union to the church of Christ significant because your heart is right, because your heart is committed to your Savior. The Christian life is is not lived for the praise of man. It's not lived so that we can have our neighbors scratch our backs while we scratch theirs. It is not lived to network or to build influence. It is lived in right response to the call of the gospel. This invitation to come to the banquet that has been issued for all. All of us in this room have heard the invitation to the banquet. And now the question is, how will we respond to it? Will we make excuse? Will we fail to attend? Or will we hear the voice of our Lord God say to us, Well done, good and faithful servant. Come and enter your rest. Let's pray together.